Welcome everyone to the Michigan Historic Preservation Network July webinar. My name is Xiaohan Bao Smith. I am going to be your moderator today, and we will be hearing a moving story about Dearborn houses. Before we get started, I would like to go over some Zoom tips. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box as you think of them. All the questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical difficulties, please also type them into the Q&A box. And the chat box will be used to share links or resources discussed during the webinar. Both of the Q&A and chat boxes are located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you don't see them, please wiggle your mouse. And please participate in the survey after the webinar concludes. If this is your first time attending our webinar, we are the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. We support the sustainability and economic viability of Michigan's historic places through advocacy, education, and direct action. We could not do the work we do without our members and volunteers. So if you're not a member yet, please consider joining us at www.mhpn.org. And our webinar series is sponsored in part by an award from the Michigan Arts and Culture Council. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, Ian Tomaschik. And Ian is a local preservationist from Dearborn, Michigan. He works part-time for the Detroit City Council Historic Designation Advisory Board and Chronicle Heritage in Dexter, Michigan. He holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from University of Michigan and is currently pursuing his master's in historic preservation at Eastern Michigan University. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our speaker. And Ian, please go ahead and share your screen. All right. Um, so, can you see this? Yes. All right. And we'll assume everyone else can too. Thank you, Zohan, for the introduction. Um, as she said, I'm a, a passionate local preservationist as well as an aspiring professional preservationist. Um, I was born, raised, and lived in Dearborn, Michigan, hence the title of my talk. Um, however, I'm actually coming to you today from Houghton, way up in the UP, uh, and I'm on the Wi-Fi of the Houghton Public Library. So if for some reason I just drop off completely, feel free to pop something in the chat and hopefully I'll see it and can return. But other than that, we'll get right into my presentation. Um, I do have to note up at the top left corner of your screen here is a little icon saying Preservation Dearborn. I prepared this uh, lecture last fall for our local preservation nonprofit called Preservation Dearborn. If you want to learn more about Dearborn history or want to see some good content related to Dearborn history, uh, go ahead and look us up on Facebook or Instagram, and you can see a whole series of things we've posted about stories and pictures we've posted about historic Dearborn sites. So this um, talk, even though we booked it about five months ago, couldn't come at a better time because for those who don't know, um, this picture is actually from Muskegon. Just last week, they moved a house that was about to be demolished. Um, so it's, it's quite topical at the moment because I know this video and pictures of this project got a lot of sharing on Facebook. Um, and ironically enough, this home was actually moved by Deep a house mover based in Muskegon, Michigan, uh, who moved the last house that was moved in Dearborn way back in 2001. Um, this house you're seeing here is actually built for Henry Ford's brother, William Ford. And the, just like this home in Muskegon, this home was moved because it was threatened with demolition, about to be torn down. Somebody said, you know, this house and this building is too important to local history. Um, we need to move it to a new site so that it gets preserved. As you're going to see in this talk, actually preservation is 
not, it's a more recent phenomenon. It's the reason that houses have been moved in the 21st century. But actually, houses have been moved for, you know, as long as, almost as long as America has been a country. We actually know about a house that was moved to Canada um, that was built in the 1700s, late 1700s, somewhere in Dearborn or the mouth of the Rouge River. And it was moved in pieces across the ice into Canada in the 1810s. So houses have been being moved in our country almost as long as our country and houses in our country have existed. And before the 21st century, before really about the 1970s, house moving was a much, much more common phenomenon than it is today. And this is really because of three reasons. One, um, you know, before Home Depot, before standardized systems that we build homes with today, it was a laborious and skilled task to build a home or a building of any kind. It was often considered much less work and much more efficient uh, to move a building that's already standing versus hiring a whole new crew of tradesmen to craft a building from scratch. Um, before, again, those systems were standardized and we had powerful equipment to help us build, move homes. Back when America was a more rural, rural country, it was much easier to move homes. Uh, there were no power lines. There were no uh, street signs. There was nothing. There were, weren't as many bridges as there were today. It was a lot easier to build a house in a, or to move a house in a lot more of the country than it is today, simply because we put up more impediments that are in our way. And the third reason house moving was more common, really in, I would say, the 19th century more than any other time, is that before um, the 1920s, most homes did not have electricity. They did not have uh, indoor plumbing. They obviously didn't have cable or phones. They didn't have any of these modern systems that today tether a home to its site. You know, a sewer line has to be dug underground and connected to your home. Before you had a sewer line, your house could go anywhere there was land and anywhere where someone was willing to move it. So house moving was a lot more common, um, especially in the early 19th century than it is today. Interestingly enough, uh, David Stevenson, an Englishman who wrote the book Sketch of Civil Engineering of, in North America in 1838, um, was fascinated by the number of houses he saw moved in New York while he was staying there in the 1830s. I have this quote at the bottom, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but my favorite part of this is, perhaps the most curious of these mechanical expedients that Americans have invented is the operation of moving houses, which is often practiced in New York. And you can see this is a uh, three-story, a four-story masonry building, and they were moving them back in the 1830s. Houses back then were moved with basically three steps. Um, one, step one, was to lift the house with a series of jacks. Um, sometimes these were powered by screws. Sometimes they were operated by cap stands uh, that horses would actually pull ropes around. Um, but in any case, the first step was simply to get the house off of the ground. The second step was to put something underneath to actually move it on. Often this was logs. And if you live in a town in rural Michigan, you know that there was probably a building at some point moved in your town on logs. Um, sometimes with logs, you could just push a house and they would roll just as easily as the home did. Um, but later as mechanical, you know, as different machines were invented and became available, it became much more common to simply insert wooden or steel beams under a home, set them on a pair of wheels, you know, stretching from carriage wheels all the way up to what would be considered a truck wheel today. Um, and then once it was up on lifted onto that cribbing, the third step was probably the easiest, which was simply roll it away. Um, homes were pulled by horses, oxen, animals before there was such thing as steam power. Um, steam traction engines, I know, were used to move houses in the 1890s through the 1910s or 20s. And after that, uh, house moving was basically done with uh, different kinds of trucks or automobiles, uh, some gasoline powered apparatus. And house moving was so common back in the 19th century that in 1873, a periodical called the American Agriculturalist even published 
a step-by-step -step article on how to do this, how to move a house. They claimed many more would know how to move badly located buildings if they knew how to do it. The means are simple enough. And after that, on the next page, they actually provided this, you know, accessible sketch showing how you could insert a dolly under a home and then with a team of horses, simply pull this house down your road to a new location. Again, keep in mind, there were no power lines back then. There were no road signs and not as many bridges. So once a house was up on wheels, it could basically move, be moved anywhere that the ground would support it. Back uh, in the 18, between the 1850s and 1870s, the city of Chicago uh, embarked on a plan to actually raise the entire city in an effort to install sewer lines and water lines underneath the ground. Um, and in the 1860s and 70s, it was so common that houses were moved in Chicago um, that David McRae, another author who was in Chicago at the time, mentioned, never a day passed during my stay that I did, that I did not meet one or more houses shifting their quarters. One day I met nine. Going out Great Madison Street in the horse cars, we had to stop twice to let houses get across. And again, you know, people didn't have indoor plumbing. They didn't have electricity. They could actually live in the houses while they were being moved or between stops on their move. Um, we have accounts of families going out for the day. Uh, kids would go to school. People would go to work. The house would move sometimes several miles during the day. And then at night, the family would all be brought back to the home and they would actually stay in it overnight while it's up on its cribbing. Now, buildings were moved too. Um, this talk is very house centric simply because I like old houses. And that's how my research, that's where my research has taken me so far. Um, but buildings were moved just as easily as houses. In fact, in 1869, this seven story hotel that weighed over 5,000 tons was turned around a corner in Boston on 904 rollers. Um, so if you think that, uh, and well, and I will should mention here that um, Detroit actually holds the record currently for the heaviest building ever moved. Uh, many of you probably know of the Gem Theater that was moved from the site uh, where Comerica Park is today uh, to its current site closer to Madison Street um, so that it was saved. That, I believe today, remains the heaviest building ever moved. But all that to say, today we're going to focus on houses. Or, in this case, early buildings. So again, you know, going back to the fact that more houses were moved in the 19th century than probably at any other time. My, in my research into Dearborn history, I've come across dozens of buildings that were moved that no longer stand. Um, in the top left corner here, St. John's Church was moved in 1874. The picture in the top right actually shows Dearborn's first railroad station, which in 1887 was uh, replaced by a newer station, and the old one was moved and turned into a house. Um, even this three-story hotel down here called Reese's Hotel was moved about three blocks up Mason Street to Michigan Avenue in the 1890s. And then in 1896, that little home in the bottom right corner, the Bellows home, uh, was moved for the construction of a bank. None of these buildings no longer stand, but we know that all of them were moved because um, different historic Dearborn residents took journals, they took notes, they captured for future generations, for us today, that each of these buildings was moved at a separate time. Actually, those notes left by previous historians are the reason we know that the oldest moved, or the reason we know that this house, which is one of the oldest in Dearborn today, uh, was actually moved. And this is the oldest moved house in Dearborn that is still standing, or I should say the earliest moved house in Dearborn that's still standing. It was built, if you look at that picture in the bottom uh, left corner of the screen, it was built on what was called the, basically it was the west side of Mason Street in the 1860s. In 1904, they sold it to the family across the street and the family moved it across the street on logs to the east side of Mason Street. And the uh, picture in the bottom uh, right corner of the screen is actually what it looks like today. It's been modernized, but it's the same home. And I've talked to the homeowner. He says that the original logs that they actually pushed the home across the street on are still in the crawl space. So 
I keep telling him that we should try moving it today, but uh, <laughs> don't think he's interested. So I keep talking about the 19th century. Houses, again, have been moved for as long as they've existed, but something happened in the 1920s that really created a boom in house moving, and not just in Dearborn, but in the entire metro Detroit area. And that was the, the process of suburbanization. As Detroit residents moved out from the city center, they moved into neighboring towns that had been rural villages before then, before the 1920s. And as they commercialized and as they grew, new buildings were constructed. Many of the old ones were simply moved out of the way so that uh, new things could be built. West Dearborn, which was a village uh, all the way up until the 1920s, grew by over 320% between 1920 and 1926. And this is just, as I say, Dearborn is kind of a case study of Metro Detroit because Dearborn sits at about the same distance outside of Detroit as Old Redford, as Royal Oak, as Wyandotte, um, and on the east side, the Gross Points. I can imagine, although I haven't done the research personally, that just as many homes and buildings were moved in those cities as they were in Dearborn. And I'll leave it to people who live in those cities to tell me if they were or not. Um, during the 1920s, again, we talked about suburbanization. The reason that many, many homes and buildings were moved during the 1920s was um, because of the suburban growth as main corridors, in this case, in Dearborn's case, Michigan Avenue, leading out from the city of Detroit, became more commercialized. Homes and residents gave way to commercial buildings, and um, you know, stores, retailers, restaurants, bars, etc. Many of those houses were moved because the city experienced such dramatic growth that they simply couldn't afford to let an old house go to waste. You know, a home on Michigan Avenue that was being torn down to build a bank uh, could house a family if it were simply moved a few blocks to a new location. And many of them were. Not only was moving houses at this time uh, a necessity because of rapid population growth, but it was also an economic choice. Again, many homes at this point didn't still didn't have indoor plumbing or electricity, so it was easier to move one than to build a new one. Ed Christ, who owned one of the biggest house moving companies in Metro Detroit, estimated that a new house could be moved or decorated or sold for about half the cost, or an old house could be moved or decorated or sold for about half the cost of building a new home. So we know of at least 19 Dearborn houses that were moved in the 1920s as the city grew, again, from a rural village into a suburban city. Now, who was doing this house moving? I mentioned Ed Christ. Edward Christ owned the Christ House Moving Company, which was uh, established along Telegraph Road. They ended up moving thousands of homes, um, but not everybody became an established entity that was dedicated to this work. Um, actually, individuals moved just as many houses as established companies did. The ads here on the bottom and right of the screen are actually ads from the Detroit Free Press um, listing people wanting to buy or selling moving equipment. Once one person moved a house or building, they no longer needed the apparatus and said, oh, well, I'll list it for sale and someone else will use it. They probably got their money back, too, for all the equipment they invested in. Um, so this technology by the 1920s was actually really accessible. It didn't take a company with, you know, an elaborate system to move a structure like it did, to, like uh, it does today. Now, one of the really interesting things I found about researching Dearborn history um, are these old photos. You know, every town, no matter where you live, you have an old photo like this of your town or city. This is Michigan Avenue, which is through East Dearborn, which is today a five-lane highway. Um, but in the 1910s was simply another rural road reading, leading outside of Detroit, uh, dotted with family farms throughout its length through Dearborn. Now, when you see an old picture like this, common wisdom says, you know, this scene is gone. It's, there's nothing about this scene that's left, unfortunately. Um, but once you start researching houses and local buildings with an eye toward the fact that they could have been moved, you actually start to realize that many of these homes still stand. So this photo is Michigan Avenue taken looking east or looking west from Miller Road in 1910. 
on the left and right, you see two separate farmhouses. Interestingly enough, both of them were moved and stand today just in completely different parts of the city. Um, the Schaefer farmhouse, which was uh, built about 1896, and that was on the right side of the road that in the picture we were just looking at, was purchased by a developer who purchased the entire farm. Um, he later subdivided it. And rather than tearing down this perfectly good home, which was only 20 years old in 1916, he decided to move it and set it on a new foundation. It was moved. Today, it looks like a four block move. Um, but at the time, the entirety of this neighborhood was actually just sealed. So he probably rolled it in a straight line up to where someone had purchased a lot uh, in the northeast corner of his subdivision. And this picture in the bottom left and or bottom right and the top right show the home in 1916, shortly after it was moved. And that's it today. It's a little disguised. You, you know, you can see the aluminum siding and the windows have been replaced, but you can tell the massing, window placement, et cetera, are all still intact. And now that we know that this home was moved, we've added another home to our list of uh, oldest homes in the city of Dearborn. That was actually the same case uh, with the home on the left side or south side of Michigan Avenue photos. This home was built by the Maples family in, in the 1880s, we believe around 1888. Um, one day I was actually preparing to give a walking tour of East Dearborn and I happened to look at Google Street View and thought, oh, that home with aluminum siding looks a lot like an old farmhouse. Sure enough, I started orbiting around it. Then I visited the home in real life and found out that all of its window placements along the rear portion of the house that you're seeing in that 1910 photo were, are correspond to what they are today. So no one had actually recorded that this home had been moved. In this case, no historian of the past or future person with an eye for history from the past wrote this down and passed it down to us. But one of the things about architecture is that People moved very quickly between phases of, or taste, architectural taste in the early 1900s. Buildings weren't saved because they thought they looked pretty or were historic. They were either torn down or moved because they could be used. So when you see an old farmhouse like this with a classic folk Victorian upright front and wing kind of gable massing, you start to kind of suspect that that home is older than a lot of the other homes in the neighborhood, especially if it's surrounded by homes from the late 1920s to early 1930s, like this one is today. The research that I did to find this photo to connect the landowners between its new lot and its former lot, um, all of that helps, sub, sub, helps substantiate the fact that this home was probably moved from its location on Michigan Avenue down the street into the neighborhood. Luckily, we do have some homes that we know were moved thanks to people who gave us notes. Uh, this home in the bottom left corner of the screen was built in the 1850s, owned by the Sloss family. This is an example of a site where uh, this home was located on Michigan Avenue, where that circle is in the top right corner of the screen. Uh, it was purchased and it was going to be torn down for a commercial building. Somebody thought, oh, well, we could still keep using that house if it were moved. So they moved it down Michigan Avenue, almost a mile to Park Street, uh, where it still stands today. And I have to call out uh, former Dearborn historian Melita Goebel, who uh, was alive in the 1950s and actually interviewed someone that said that they had moved this house. And so she left this little note for us so that I could rediscover it today. Another Dearborn home that was moved in the 1920s was actually, or 1930s in this case, was moved because of its proximity to a new attraction. In the top left corner of the screen there, that's the Dearborn Country Club located at Outer Drive and Military Avenue. Um, both of the owners of the homes in that picture that were originally across the street thought, wow, this is going to be a lot of traffic coming by. So both of those homes in this picture were actually moved to places to other sites uh, nearby. The home to the left was kind of turned around the corner and is still in the area of the country club. But this home that's pictured in the bottom uh, left corner of the screen was again, moved almost a mile up Military Avenue where it still stands today. And you can tell this is a substantial house. It's brick. It's um, It was actually a two family home. So it has 
probably 4,000 square feet of space inside. Well, maybe not, maybe more like 3,000. But still, this was a substantial home that was moved. And it was done, again, simply because at the time, all of these neighborhoods and, you know, traffic lights and power lines and trees that are in the way didn't exist. When this home was moved, it was simply rolled up Military Avenue without any kind of real problems, without any kind of real uh, obstacles in the way. Now, I keep talking about homes that have been moved in Dearborn, but uh, houses also move from one city to another city. We're going to give an example of this, more examples of this later on. Um, but I've recently uncovered a couple homes that were moved into Dearborn. One came from Detroit. Um, but this home that's pictured was actually moved by a family, uh, by the Connolly family. This gentleman that's pictured in the upper left is Frank Connolly. He owned a farm with his family up in Lake Township, uh, right outside of Saginaw. And uh, he actually moved to Dearborn in 1919, presumably to take a job with an automotive plant. Um, and he decided he was going to take his entire house with him. He disassembled this home piece by piece from his farm in Lake Township and brought it to Dearborn and rebuilt it in 1919. Here again is a case where you had to do some digging to find this out. Um, this home's official build date in the city of Dearborn is 1919 because of course it's built uh, from numbered pieces. But thankfully on Ancestry, the family, the Connolly family researched their family tree and shared the story of the fact that Uncle Frank actually dismantled his house and said, oh, I'll just move it. And thanks to you know that this home is moved today. House moving kind of hit a lull during the Great Depression, as did home building, um, you know, just because of the state of the economy. The construction industry was very slow before World War II uh, in the entire metro Detroit area due to the Great Depression. However, by the 19, late 1940s, early 50s, the post-war era, Dearborn, like many other cities, was in a spurt of growth, was experiencing a growth spurt that very much echoed what happened in the 1920s. Between 1940, Dearborn's population almost doubled from 63,000 in 1940 to almost 110,000 by 1960. Again, because of that, people wanted to move to Dearborn. Homes were still a little more difficult to build than they are today. So more people, and land was a little bit more available in Dearborn than it is today. So more homes were moved than torn down during this period simply because of demand. People said, oh, well, if I just move it, I can live in it somewhere else. Two kind of major groupings of projects we know caused house moves. One of them was school expansion, and then the other one was urban renewal. And I'm going to give examples of both of those. Um, but we know, too, that at least 34 Dearborn houses were moved during the post-war era. So each of those uh, kind of represents an individual case that I had to research. Interestingly enough, um, Houses were moved outside of the city of Detroit during this period at a much, much faster rate than they were within the city of Dearborn. Because of the construction of the freeways through the city of Detroit, people bought houses at bargains. And again, because they had to be moved, they did it. They did it because they could afford this home. And even though they had to move it, they could afford the lot where it was moved to. And, uh, you know, by the end of the day, this family that moved this home uh, got a $21,000 house for $2,000. That seems like a pretty good deal. Um, we know that at least thousands of homes were moved outside of the city of Detroit during the 1950s, again, mostly because of freeway construction. And this is because there were actually three major companies in Detroit or the Detroit area dedicated to house moving. One was the C.A. Johnson Company. They moved several buildings, including Mariner Skirts, located on Jefferson in downtown Detroit. They also moved um, a, a, the convent in the city of Dearborn for Sacred Heart Church, which I have a picture of. But you can see there, they moved over 1,000 homes and buildings just themselves, not outside of the city of Detroit, all of them outside of the city of Detroit, but many of them. The Christ House Moving Company, again, which I described, was actually founded back in the 1920s and 1929. They moved about 150 buildings every year. Christ was a, a pretty um, entrepreneurial company. They actually bought up large tracts of land up near Saginaw, or sorry, up near Lansing. There are 
I know of houses in Fowlerville, in South Lyon, in Lansing that were moved up Grand River Avenue outside the city of Detroit. So some of these homes were moved 100 miles just because they could then move them and resell them because they had the equipment to do it. They could move them and resell them at a profit. Another house moving company that um, is notable is Westside House Moving and Raising. They did a lot of work in Dearborn and Detroit. They were actually based in Southwest Detroit on Lanio Street. Um, and I just know from pictures that we've uncovered of buildings being moved that they moved, again, hundreds of structures. They moved actually about a dozen outside of the city of Dearborn that we're going to look at. During the 1950s, I said two big groupings of, of themes of projects led to uh, house moves. One was school construction. Thanks to the baby boom, we had to build new schools. Actually, Dearborn built or expand, built 11 new schools during the 1950s and added on to at least four old schools. Many of those schools were surrounded by 1920s neighborhoods, and in order to build a new one or expand on it, uh, they had to move houses out of the way. Again, private institutions, actually churches that built uh, schools for their, their, their student bodies during the 1950s, at least two of them moved houses while they were building their new church schools. Um, and five school construction projects were, were known to actually have houses moved. This, this newspaper article I have over on the right side of the screen here is actually published by the city of Dearborn. They're talking about the construction of a new middle school that uh, there were four houses on the property at the time and they offered them at auction. I know that two of the ones here that were actually listed. Thanks to the Hagelthorne family, uh, and I'll uh, shout out to Lisa El Cadre if she happens to hear about this because uh, she provided these photos to me. They owned what was called a Ford home, a, a home owned that was actually built by Ford Motor Company by Henry Ford for a tractor plant that came to Dearborn in the 1920s. In the background of this photo off on the right, you can see that little building. That's Duval Elementary School. They built a large addition onto their school during the 1950s, again, to accommodate the baby boom. And at least four Ford homes were moved uh, to different places within the neighborhood for this construction. Lisa shared with me that her family actually took a series of photos as this house was being moved. So the first one is it on its site, again, lifted up, jacked straight up with cribbing and steel beams inserted underneath it, ready to be moved. The top right and bottom left photos are it leaving its old location, showing that, you know, trees needed to be trimmed, but otherwise it rolled right down the middle of the street. And this photo in the bottom right, uh, is it actually passing another house while it's moving to its new site? I love these photos because so many houses were moved that a lot of people didn't take photos. Again, it was considered a pretty regular occurrence. Um, but for the families that actually had their homes moved, many of them were probably pretty attached to this process. And Lisa uh, Hagelthorne, formerly Hagelthorne, actually shared with me these photos. Another good house move that we have documented related to a school is the construction of Sacred Heart High School, uh, which is in West Dearborn. They had two homes on the property, actually three homes, and they moved all three of them. Uh, two still stand today, and two of them were moved to the same location. Here you can see again the process of the house being moved off of its old site in the top left, it rolling down the street in the two right photos, and then this home on its new site in the um, uh, bottom left photo here. This house move is pretty interesting because for this one, we actually have a video. And I took a pause because I wanted you guys to see that portion of the video. You know, house moving was not that slow of a process. This entire move probably only took a day. Um, and actually, this family happened to have a uh, old reel-to-reel -reel, uh, home video system that they were able to take this video as the homes passed their house. They probably only paused there for about 10 minutes while they raised a power line, and then they kept going down the street. So house moving wasn't that slow or that laborious of a process, even in the 1950s. In fact, uh, once Sacred Heart had moved these three houses out of the way, they actually took their convent, uh, which you can see in the top photo here, a giant three-story masonry building, and they moved it a lot over as well. 
According to the church's bulletin, or the chronicle as they called it, Sister Marie Dolores' piano lesson, the fourth grade resident Teresa Horger, went on interrupted throughout the move. They actually later said that they didn't even know the building was being moved, or they wouldn't have known the building was being moved unless they had known it going in. So that's a testament to the ease with which some of these movers worked. The other big uh, reason that so many homes were moved during the 1950s was urban renewal. We think of urban renewal as really being a downtown thing. You know, it happened in Detroit, in the cities of Wayne and Pontiac, uh, tore down blocks and blocks of space to put in new roads, parking lots, et cetera. Dearborn had it too. Actually, Mayor Orville Hubbard uh, built over 35 parking lots in the city of Dearborn between 1951 and 67, providing almost 5,000 off-street parking spaces. It was considered that our older 1910s, 20s downtown districts would completely lose business to shopping malls unless these parking lots were provided. Um, so that's why the, the mayor was really heralded for this effort, even though me as a preservationist is pretty upset about it. One of the streets that ended up being a parking lot was this one pictured here, Neckel Street, uh, an entire block of houses. There were almost 40 homes on this block between Michigan Avenue and Colson Street were moved within the, sp or sorry, were demolished or moved within the span of just two years. What went from a completely, you know, a, a very dense residential street here in 19, 59 by 1961 was completely empty. And what you can see here is the last house uh, in that stretch being moved off to a new location. We know that at least nine homes were moved as a result of this project, just to empty lots throughout East Dearborn. And even though, you know, I wish they could have stayed where they were, it's pretty amazing that nine of these houses were considered new enough, nice enough to move and reuse rather than letting them be torn down. Um, one of the homes that was moved was actually built in the early 50s, just before um, this parking lot was, project was begun. And here you can see it being moved down the middle of Neckel Street. They simply lopped branches off the trees and uh, loaded it up with on a West Side house moving rig. And because it was probably only, well, if it was built in 1951, it would have been only nine years old at the time this parking lot project was started. Uh, this family thought that all of this hassle was worth it. Notice in this photo, um, the sides of the homes look like they're paper. There's the white shingle or the white uh, wood siding up on the front there, but the sides of the homes are all just paper. They actually took off all of this home's brick veneer in order to move it and put up a new brick veneer in its place when it moved to it its current location. Another reason I love this photo is behind it, you can actually see really, really small. The garage is hooked up on its own trailer uh, and is being towed behind the house by a separate truck. They moved their garage to a new location as well. Now, and nothing in Dearborn can be talked about without talking about Henry Ford. Um, Henry Ford grew up in Dearborn in the 1860s and he grew up on a farm. He probably saw dozens of buildings like barns, houses, corn cribs, silos, et cetera, being moved while he was growing up on those farms. So by the 1920s and 30s, when he purchased up a lot of homes in Dearborn or farms in Dearborn for factory use or for farming use, um, he basically didn't want to tear down the homes that were already there. He moved a lot of them away. He actually exclaimed to uh, the Ford Farms foreman, Fritz Laskowski, any damn fool can tear the house down. I want it moved whole right over there. Henry Ford's own words, at least from the memories of Fritz Laskowski, uh, thanks to the Benson Ford Research Center. Of course, anyone that knows anything about Dearborn, even if you've never been here, knows that Greenfield Village and the Henry Ford Museum are major destination and tourist attraction. Uh, Henry Ford built this village to preserve a little piece of rural Americana that Ironically enough, his automobile helped destroy. Um, but to create this village, he moved tons of buildings from around the Detroit area as well as um, out on the East Coast. He moved one building from England all the way to Dearborn to reassemble this village. Uh, this is actually a grist mill from down in Monroe, Michigan, that uh, was moved to Green Ford Village, Greenfield Village. And we know that this was done by Ford Farms because the rig actually has Ford Motor Company 
uh, listed in the front on the bottom there underneath the wheel. This little log cabin was moved from Ford Road through Dearborn into Greenfield Village in the 1920s. Um, it was owned by the Salter family, and it was a family that Henry Ford knew when he was young, and actually he slept in the loft as a kid, so he thought, oh, I'll preserve this house because it's a log house. Not only was this home moved into Greenfield Village, where it sat as a tourist attraction between 1929 and 1995, but this home actually survives today not in the village because it was moved again. In 1995, Greenfield Village deaccessioned de this log cabin, and it was saved by the uh, Michigan Log Cabin Society, or something like that. Forgive me if I'm butchering the name. Um, and actually moved up to Crossroads Village in Flint, a little bit of a mini Greenfield Village where the Huckleberry Railroad is located. Um, so if you go up to uh, Crossroads Village today, you can actually see this log cabin that came all the way from Dearborn to Flint. Henry Ford didn't just move houses into Greenfield Village. He also moved houses off of his farms into other areas of Dearborn and other cities. Uh, this house stood in the area of Ford Airport that he was building in Dearborn, where the uh, Ford Motor Company Proving Grounds is now located. This is actually the house that he gave to an employee that he took, well, instructed his foreman with that quote at the beginning of this section uh, to move. So this home was moved all the way from Dearborn to Romulus, right by the Detroit Metro Airport, where it still stands today. Another thing Henry Ford did was give houses to people who he thought needed them, you know, especially when he began selling off farms by the 1930s, 1940s. Henry Ford was noted to have taken care of his employees in the way that he thought he needed to. Um, Fritz Laskowski said, Ford gave several houses to people down and out. He told me what he used to do for people all over, help them out and stuff like that. Nothing went in the papers. And this home pictured is actually one of those homes that was never recorded that Henry Ford moved it. Um, but it sits in a place where it's kind of out of place today along Cherry Hill Road in Dearborn. I've been talking to the, talked to the homeowners a few years ago. They gave me a little bit of the story and I found out that this home was actually moved because um, one of Ford Farms employees was killed or actually worked, at, worked on a tractor but died of influenza in 1919. Uh, and Henry Ford was worried about his widow and their five children. So he gave them this house from one of his farms and had it moved to their own lot in West Dearborn where it stands today. I keep talking about these farms. For those of you that aren't from Dearborn or Metro Detroit, um, Henry Ford owned a ton of land. He did this because he just really because he wanted to. He had the money to buy up acres and acres of land, although down in southeastern Michigan around Adrian, Macon, uh, Clinton, those towns, he actually established later what were called Ford Farms. They were producing farms that helped uh, that he had employees working on and they produced farm, you know, they raised crops as effectively as they made cars. In Dearborn, he purchased over 2000 acres of farmland. And all of this land, most of this land remained farmland up until the time he died in 1947. Now, each of these homes or each of these farms had a home on it at the time that he passed away. So in the early 50s, um, three Ford individual, Ford related individuals actually got together and formed their own partnership to move some of these homes to new locations. Again, it was the 1950s. The baby boom was in full swing. People needed houses. So how could you let these 12 houses go perfectly to waste or go to waste when they could be moved and create perfectly good homes somewhere else? Um, so Russell Burns was a Ford Farms employee. Robert D. Farrell was a doctor employed at Ford Soybean Lab. And Delbert E. Roberts was a Ford Farms employee who had moved houses with his father in the state of Ohio. Um, and together between 1951 and 1956, they moved 12 houses outside of the city of Dearborn to Detroit, Garden City, uh, Dearborn Heights, Inkster, and Westland. These are some of the homes that they moved. The two on the top are actually shown in the process of being moved. Both of them are raised onto the beams that they were about to be rolled away on. And the two down at the bottom there were another two of the houses that were moved outside of the city in 1952. Henry Ford had owned all of these houses for years, basically because he didn't want Ford Farms to change. He wanted the 
countryside where he grew up in Dearborn to stay the way it was throughout his life. And he achieved that um, by keeping these homes standing. He actually allowed different Ford employees to live in them while they were on the farms. After he died, they were no longer needed. So they again were moved to different places. This home is pretty interesting um, because the Garden City Historical Society has done some research on this home. And they actually talked to the owners in the 1990s that told how it was moved and how, where it was moved. So they stated that, you know, the home weighs 256,000 pounds, was moved down Ford Road over the bridge that then existed on the, Fort, on the Rouge River in Dearborn to Inkster Road, traveled one mile north to Warren Avenue, turned left, came past Middle Belt Road, and was brought across the field to its site today, which bordered Ed Wolf's farm, complete with grazing cows. Again, for those that don't know Metro Detroit, um, that's about a six or seven mile move that this home completed. And again, at that time, it was mostly undeveloped. So even in the 1950s, Garden City was really just developing. So it was through farmland that this house was being moved. This home is one of my favorites because it's the only one that we actually have a picture of Henry Ford standing in front. So this was the McCormick farmhouse that was built in the 1870s at the corner of Porter Road and Southfield. The picture in the top left is it at its original site. And the picture on its top right is how it looks today. It was moved to the place to a road street behind DeLuca's restaurant in Westland um, in 1951 by the three gentlemen I mentioned earlier. And down at the bottom here is the picture from the Benson Ford Research Center. And again, I love it because it actually shows Henry Ford on the far left with Grandpa George McCormick, as he called him, on the far right uh, with two other neighbors in front of an experimental Model N car um, in front of the side of this house because Henry Ford would come visit them whenever he wanted to. Um, this home, I left it in the presentation. It's a little obscure, but it actually just sold. And uh, you, can, you may be able to Google the address, 7418 Arcola Street, and still see the interior if any of the listings are left next. So by this point, so many houses were moved out of Dearborn that you wonder why it, ha why it stopped. You know, you don't see houses moving off everywhere willy-nilly today. Really, it started in the 1970s. Um, in Metro Detroit, there were fewer vacant lots available because most of our neighborhoods had been built up by that time. Modern amenities like electricity, trees, signage, all of those blocked routes for moving. So it made, hard, made it harder to move houses to a new location. And really, house moving fell out of fashion because of places like Home Depot. During the uh, post-war housing boom, so many houses were built that uh, construction practices were standardized. It made it cheaper and easier to build a house than move it. And as a result, fewer homes were moved. And today, we unfortunately just tear them down most of the time. Today, it's really preservationists are the only people that move homes. People who see a value in a house that is more than it's, you know, the sum of its parts, the value of its place in local history, in national history, whatever that may be. Those are the kind of houses that are moved today. And that uh, house move was actually the one that was pictured at the beginning of my presentation. This is the Richard Gardner farmhouse, which was built in the 1830s, moved to Greenfield Village in 1929. At the same time that that log cabin was moved up to Flint, this house was moved to the grounds of the Dearborn Historical Museum as an interpretive center where it still stands today. Again, this house had value more than just as a home. It was a sign of People, it was represented and captured what life was like for residents of the Dearborn area in the 1830s, hence why it was moved to be preserved. And then we get to the uh, final move, which I already have showed you a picture of. This is the last house to be moved in Dearborn up until this point. Um, this was done in 2001. And again, as I mentioned, this was actually built for Henry Ford's brother. William Ford was going to be torn down to build a set of condominiums. Thankfully, the Borowski family said, no, this is too important. We're going to move it. And Dietz came all the way out from Muskegon, Michigan, and uh, helped with this project. And I have to plug a little project we're working on at the moment. No house in Dearborn has been moved since 2001. But right now, we're actually working on preservation Dearborn, as well as the Dearborn Public Library, are partnering to try to move this house 
which still stands. This is the oldest home still standing in Dearborn. It was built about 1850. Um, you can see at the, the top right picture, the big picture is what it looked like in the 1890s. And the bottom right picture is what it looks like today, even though that's the back of the home. Um, we're trying to actually move it to a site next to the Dearborn Public Library to be used as an urban garden interpretive center. And let me tell you, I'm having a really hard time trying to get a house mover to come to Dearborn. So if anybody on this call knows someone that moves houses or would be willing to try to move a house, please let me know. I could use the help. And that is the end of my presentation. So I see there's some questions in the chat, but because I was talking, I haven't looked at them. So <laughs> we can do questions now. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Ian, for this presentation. It's wonderful information and really a lot of good stories. Um, we are now going to answer some questions from our Q&A box. Okay, so there's a comment um, saying that current building codes also play a role in the reduction of house moving and moved houses are often required to meet the current building codes. Is that such a, do you have any experience in that? Like being a uh, difficult part? I will say, I don't know that it's so much building codes um, as it is it is building codes, but but zoning is, I would say, even more restrictive than building codes. Um, to try to move this house like we're trying to right now, you have to have a police escort, you have to have DTE come out to raise the power lines, you have to have permits, you have to have insurance. Um, yes, uh, building codes do make it more difficult to move a house than it used to be. Um, once it's on its new site, as long as you're not violating any building codes, um, you know, and rate it's set on its new foundation, it's not so much of an issue, but codes do certainly play a role in the actual moving process. Have you seen any buildings moved that were able to maintain their designation on the National Register of Historic Places? That is an excellent question. Um, I do know of buildings that were moved that are on the National Register of Historic Places. I personally, I'm thinking, we're actually having this discussion right now. Um, as you mentioned, I work for the city of Detroit, and one of our old local historic districts um, was the David McKenzie House, which is owned by Preservation in Detroit. Um, it was moved about three years ago. Uh, to build a new auditorium at Wayne State. And that's something that we're working through with the local designation is we have to go back and amend the ordinance so that the designation follows the home to its new site. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the National Register discourages moved buildings because they lose their significance of place. However, this is something that, you know, I would like to see changed in the future because at a certain point, if you can't move the building, then it also can't be saved. So it's always a give and take, right? Yeah, in this comment, um, it says the register has very specific guidelines on how to do it, but it can be done. It's probably very difficult, but something to look into. It depends on, on the site too. Like the house that I know that's on the National Register is designated, you simply, if, if it's a home that is significant for the home or building itself that isn't so much tied to its site or a location, then its significance hasn't been compromised by a move to the point that a, like say a whole rural farmstead that was completely disassembled and moved into a city has lost a lot of its significance because there's no, mm -hmm. um, there's no sense of place of its original place anymore tied to that building. So it probably depends a lot on the specific mm -hmm thing being designated. Yeah. And um, next question, were house movers registered businesses? Is there a roster of companies in the metropolitan area that might lead to records of their work? That is, I would love to know. <laughs> right now, there is a, a group called the International Association of Structural Movers. The IASM is a currently active association of registered moving companies that, uh, you know, there's a handful in each state and they all, some of, many of them have joined this association. Um, and you can find a house mover that way. When it comes to house movers being businesses, 
you know, once they could no longer do it profitably, most of them just closed up just like any other business. And I haven't been able to find anyone that says, you know, I saved the records of this house moving company. That would be great if they did. I'll let you know. Okay, okay um, next question. Can you speak to the use of temporary bracing to protect the structure during the move? Um, it was not um, apparent from any of the photos. That's another great question. Um, so what they're referring to is like what if we try to move this house or actually I'll go back to um, when the Ulysses S. Grant house was moved from the old state fairgrounds to Eastern Market in Detroit they actually built a system of braces inside the home to keep it stable, to make sure that nothing shifted while it was being moved. I don't have any good photos of anyone having built braces inside of a home while it was moved, um, but it is a crucial component of some moves. Whether or not, you know, it's always done, I'm, again, probably is tied very much to the specific house. The Grant House was actually lifted off and moved in two sections, so bracing was crucial. Um, but I also know of houses like the Gardner House was not braced inside when it was moved. It's a timber frame 1830s home. Um, they actually, con the con contractors that did this work did not see a need to provide any bracing inside this specific home when it was being built. That is probably due to its construction method, its size, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, next question. So was um, amateurs moving their own buildings? Um, there must be some spectacular accidents. Are you, do you know any or could you comment on any? I, I know of a couple. Um, I, when I gave this lecture last um, fall in Dearborn, a gentleman who did plaster repair came up and spoke with me afterward. He said that they actually pre repaired the plaster in a home that was moved um, somewhere northwest of, of Detroit. I can't remember exactly. It might have been Farmington. He said that the plaster was so cracked inside this house that they worked on it for months trying to get it level. Um, I do know of another story in Dearborn where uh, it's actually kind of sad. They were moving a house on a lot just a few feet over so that they could put a driveway down the middle of their lot. During the move, the house slid and kind of fell into the basement and the homeowner that was watching from the backyard was elderly. She was so upset that she actually had a heart attack and died. Because, um, so it's it's quite sad. But interestingly enough, the house is actually still the house is still standing even though it was dropped during its move. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are more. Okay. Um. Next question. Um. In the Heritage Hill Historic uh, District in Grand Rapids. Um, there was a wonderful historic home that was found to have a, an earlier, smaller home completely inside of it. Have you run into anything like that? Wow, that's pretty interesting. Um, I do know of a couple stories. Uh, both the stories I know of in Dearborn are gone. Um, one interesting slide that I took out of this presentation, just because like I said, I tried to make it more general than so Dearborn focused, um, was actually a house that was built of two different moved buildings. One was a house and then one was a, a shoe shop from another part of Dearborn. And in 1913, they moved both of them and attached them to create a new home. Um, so I fully believe that there are homes out there that are, uh, you know, older homes entombed within newer homes with those families added on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and... Um... Next question. Um, so what is the most common way are you as a researcher tipped off to a building having been moved? Is that newspaper coverage or where do you find the record? That's a great question. Um, it depends on the home. With the older farmhouses that were moved, the reason I talked about the architecture of that one home is because sometimes you can just tell if a home looks older, and all of the homes around it and you start digging into its history and you know sometimes homes have a recorded build date of say 1940 when it very clearly looks like a 1920s house um, that's a dead giveaway for a home that was moved in Dearborn I actually have a friend at the city that's been helping me find permits that 
after Dearborn incorporated as a city in 1929, you needed a permit to move a house. So those are still, you know, the old copies of those historic permits are still tied to the property. That's one way. Um, newspaper clippings are another way. Sometimes, um, you know, there'll be a story about such and such moved a house. Um, so that I found listings that are moved houses that way. Um, another way is, oh, again, um, notes, you know, at the Dearborn Historical Museum, we have collections of oral histories and journals kept by former residents. You know, sometimes they'll say, oh, I saw a house moved. Um, it, I can't say there's any one way, but sometimes you just know, and it's about looking for the right pieces of information to, you know, help lead you to that conclusion. Okay, next question. Um, this must be, uh, have been a national phenomenon like people are doing that nationwide or, but were there any area of the country that where house moving never caught on? That's a great question. I, I don't know for sure because I really only, I, I'm a big into local history. If you ask me about Metro Detroit, I can tell you about houses that were moved in other cities. Um, and as far as the country goes, I, I don't think I can answer that. Hey. So one comment from Christopher Werner, um, contact the Chesterfield Historical Society for the name of the house mover they used to move a stone church a few miles. Okay. All right, I will. Thank you. And um, there's another comment um, from Nathan, Nathan Niedering from Schiphol, and this is like a large... Um, Italianate that was moved a couple blocks in Muskegon last week, and he shared a video, and it's in the chat, so everybody can watch. Oh, cool. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I wish I could have gotten out to see it, because I haven't seen a home moved in person yet. Um, I know that there were two in Detroit uh, like three or four years ago, but I couldn't get out to see either one, so thank you. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have. And um, if you have any more questions coming up after this, um, please feel us to contact us and um, I will pass your um, questions to the speakers. And thank you again so much for your time. Um, and before I let everybody go, I would like to just quickly announce our next webinar, which is scheduled for August 15th at one o'clock. And it's about the Milton, a Battle Creek gem returns. And I will hope to see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, so much for your presentation. Of course, thank you for the opportunity to present. I enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. Bye.